we are back. This is Lee Stranahan. I'm here with my host, John Kiriakou. And by the way, if you have a terrestrial radio and you enjoy a boombox, something like that, a Philco, as I used to have in my Mustang. Well, here's another question, John, before we get to Caleb Malcolm, real quick. What was your first car? Mine was a 71 Mustang convertible. What was your first car, John? Oh, yeah. Mine mine was a 72 Dodge Charger Special Edition. Oh, a Mopar guy. Yeah, it was fabulous. I think about it a lot. My brother started out as a Ford guy like me, but he's become a Mopar guy. And I can't I can't really argue with that. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing sure. And the new the new chargers are as close as we have in this day and age to a muscle car. Those are nice. Oh yeah, they are. The chargers and the challengers. Really, really cool cars. Yeah, yeah. The challenger challenger's great too. Joining us now, Caleb Mopin. We love having Caleb on the show. He, of course, is an RT correspondent and an author. Hey, Caleb, how are you doing today? I'm great. How about yourself? How both are you doing? Good to talk to you. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, I'm good. John, you're good, right? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Okay. So, Caleb, we were just talking about this with Alexander Mercoris. It was very interesting to me that China, literally, like, within an hour after the inauguration, I think it must have been. Like within an hour after the inauguration, they announced sanctions against 28 people, including Mike Pompeo, the ex, the barely ex Secretary of State. He still had the Secretary of State skank, uh, stank on him from uh, just just being Secretary of State. There was maybe a skank too. I don't know. I'm not getting into his personal life, but the Chinese sanctioned him and a bunch of other people, including the newly pardoned Steve Bannon. And uh, we were talking about that with Alexander. What was your take on that, Caleb? Well, it seems like China, which has pulled ahead amid this global pandemic, while economies around the world are not expanding, theirs certainly was, and they you know, experienced at least some rate of growth in 2020. Uh, they're saying, look, uh, you can sanction us and we can sanction you back. And uh, why not uh, make a symbolic gesture and go after some of the people uh, that have accused us of allegations that are widely disputed, uh, that have been funding uh, groups in Hong Kong that have been engaging in provocative acts of street violence, lighting people on fire, uh, et cetera. And uh, on top of that, since Mike Pompeo really made his Twitter page just, you know, a, a, a festival of anti-Chinese uh, hysteria, why not, uh, you know, make a statement as he heads out of office that they don't particularly care much for that? Um, and I think it's also to send a message, if you listened to Biden's speech, uh, you know, Biden was very, very, very much repudiating the previous four years. It was probably a gesture to Biden. Look, the past four years are over. You don't like the guys who came before you. Neither do we. Uh, so maybe that's something we have in common. And maybe we can sit down and resolve this and, and end this trade war and reach a conclusion uh, where we can have better relations between the two countries. And yes, you talked a tough game against us during the elections. And yes, you're not Beijing Biden. You're not a communist. You're not a sympathizer with China. But, you know, maybe we can restart all of this. Um, and uh, we don't like the Trump guys either. So let's let's negotiate. I mean, it sounds like to me that's what the gesture said. That's very interesting. You know, I, I heard, too, some messages in Biden's speech today about human rights. He didn't come right out and address the issue as a separate issue. But it was sort of this blanket um Oh, recommitment, I guess, to to longstanding American policy on human rights. Uh, and that made me think of the news that we've seen over the previous, I don't know, year or two about the Uyghurs in Western China. The United Nations says that there's a genocide there. Uh, the Chinese say there is no such uh, genocide going on, that this is a, an uprising. It's a national security issue. Where should we expect the Biden people, Caleb, to fall on the issue of the Uyghurs? Do you foresee any kind of change in U.S. policy toward China because of this? Uh, I don't think the U.N. said that there was a genocide. I think there were certain countries within the United Nations who used their platform at the U.N., to make that allegation. Um, but there were many countries at the UN who did not agree with that allegation, uh -huh. and not just China, not just Russia, but many countries around the world didn't buy that allegation. But certainly that allegation is being made by a number of US-aligned countries 
Um, but there are a number of countries that are, you know, sympathetic to China and Russia, and a number of countries that are just kind of neutral, you know, like India and other countries that are saying, eh, we don't quite buy that. Um, but look, human rights has become the mantra of, of U.S. military policy. It used to be we were going around the world to fight the communists because, you know, you know the Vietnamese were going to get in their canoes and, and come over here and, and invade the United States and, you know, abolish our American way of life. And so we had to stop the domino theory or whatever. Now, uh, you know, the Pentagon is just uh, Superman. Uh, and wherever uh, Superman hears people around the world being oppressed, why uh, he jumps into the nearest phone booth and puts on his Pentagon Superman costume and flies into action to rescue the oppressed and anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, the United States is just a great superhero and the Pentagon is nothing but this humanitarian rescue organization that goes around saving people all over the planet. Uh, that's the narrative we get. Uh, people say that, that really probably started, you know, being the dominant justification for U.S. military interventions with the Clinton administration in Yugoslavia, right? There was no, no, no perception that, that Serbia and Slobodan Milosevic were in any way a threat to the United States, but the United States had to intervene because it was just this moral obligation. And then the rest of the world looks at this and says, really, you are so concerned about human rights in certain select countries, but you're aligned with Saudi Arabia, uh, and you're aligned with all kinds of brutal dictatorships in South and Central America, and you've got all kinds of brutal human rights violating regimes that you not only are friendly with, but give weapons and money to, and something's not right about this narrative, but that's not the way it goes on CNN, and, uh, and this is how it always goes. And this is kind of an interesting aspect of how the liberal narrative has triumphed. It used to be, you know, we were fighting the Reds and the Commies and, and communism had to stop from expanding. Now it's the United States is this purveyor of liberal values all around the world. And we have this global responsibility to, to bring liberal ideas to all of these countries around the world. And, and uh, it, it's kind of a, a change in the narrative. And I think this may be what some of the Trump allies were talking about when they talked about globalism. Um, the Trump folks were just as much in favor favor of military interventionism, at least the Pompeo and Gina Haspel crowd. Um, but they seem to justify it more in terms of the interests of the U.S. population overall, not this kind of global human rights narrative. Lee, this is uh, an important point, and I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, too. Uh, this is an important point that Caleb makes because there really is a double standard. There really is hypocrisy uh, in U.S. foreign policy, especially on the issue of human rights. You know, every embassy, every U.S. embassy in the world, every U.S. embassy in every country with which we have diplomatic relations every year is tasked with writing a uh, human rights report on that country and submitting it to Congress. I was the human rights officer in, in Bahrain for two years. I wrote that report. It's quite an undertaking. And, and it usually goes for hundreds and hundreds of pages. So we like to, we like to pretend that we're a shining beacon of human rights, yet we provide arms and, uh, and aid to countries run by dictators. Uh, we have this special relationship with the likes of Saudi Arabia, for example, and, and many other countries that are run by dictators. Uh, we have a death penalty of our own uh, here in this country. And then we criticize other countries for doing exactly the same kind of thing that we do. Is that going to change? Let me, let me give you the – let me give you this – the other side of exactly the same coin, because I agree with what both you guys are saying, but I'm going to bring up a what sounds at first like a completely different point, but is actually the same thing. So as somebody who I worked for Steve Bannon, and I wrote for Breitbart for many years, people on the right, you don't hear people at the right as they get together, talk about human rights. I'm just telling you, I, you know, if, if you're at CPAC walking around, there's not a lot of discussion either up on the stage or just at the open bars at night about, hey, you know, I'm really worried about human rights. No one talks about that. Just, so I'm just saying, it's just not a topic of discussion. But you know what has been a big topic of discussion for a few years is radical Islamic terrorism. And you'd hear that up on the stage and people talking about it. People on, on the right are concerned about radical Islamic terrorism. In fact, when Trump first came into office, he made a point of saying, look, the media won't say radical Islamic terrorism. And I'll say it over and over again. He kind of stopped doing that. This is the same issue. Here's the hypocrisy. If I was at Breitbart and Breitbart had decided under Bannon to be 
We're really going to be pro-China. I could have done article after article after article about radical Islamic terrorism in China by the Uyghurs. That, right, that's what the issue there is. And I'm not even trying to take a side, but it's not like just the Chinese decided, we don't like you. There is a real problem with terrorism in that region. And <clears throat> what, what they did was they've gotten, think about this, it's amazing, because I've seen it on the right. They've gotten right-wing people who five years ago were talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and all this other stuff, and they didn't even know what they were talking about because they didn't know that the Muslim World League was a bigger deal. They've got them to take up the plight of the Uyghurs as part of their new Cold War narrative on China. So on the left, I agree with you. They talk about human rights and they're hypocrites and hypocrites completely. But on the right, they no longer talk about radical Islamist terrorism, certainly as it relates to China. So, uh, uh, Caleb, I, I'm curious about what both of you have to say about that. Caleb, take it. Well, what's interesting is I think Zbigniew Brzezinski would be absolutely delighted with this inauguration and with this new administration. Zbigniew Brzezinski considered himself to be kind of a mentor to Barack Obama. There's connections there with the Columbia University Center of Communist Studies, where Obama Obama studied at Columbia, and that's where Brzezinski's kind of, you know, academic following was. And that Zbigniew Brzezinski, his whole strategy for the Cold War, as he said, let's make the Cold War less ideological. Let's downplay this capitalism versus communism stuff. And instead, let's, you know, find people in the communist world and find people in the East that can be allies and, and we can use as kind of proxies. And let's play up the differences uh, among the Soviet Eastern Bloc and between China and the USSR. And let's, let's covertly manipulate uh, potential rivals of the United States against each other. And it was Vigny Brzezinski who bragged about the Afghan trap and how the Soviet Union was lured into Afghanistan and how the United States worked with a wealthy young Saudi by the name of Osama bin Laden to build an army of extremists uh, in Afghanistan to fight against the People's Democratic Republic. Um, and they eventually won, and that's where the Taliban came from. What's interesting is that China at that point, you know, was being courted by the United States as an ally against the Soviets. And in the Uyghur regions, uh, that's where Osama bin Laden and uh, the U.S. CIA and others set up shop on China's border with Afghanistan. And that's why there is a base of jihadist and Wahhabi extremism in that region. It mainly comes from the fact that that China allowed the U.S. CIA and others to, to set up those kind of networks there to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. Uh, so the legacy of Brzezinski, the legacy of kind of courting different extremist and radical groups around the world, utilizing them as proxies against our geopolitical rivals, uh, that legacy is very, very well alive. And I think that's why you know, on the right, there was this whole thing, you know, you know, why will Obama never say radical Islamic terror? Oh, it's because he's a secret Muslim. Obama wasn't a Muslim. But it was about the fact that the United States was actively courting people in places like Libya and Syria to be proxies of American intelligence, to tear down the, the government of Libya, which had the highest life expectancy on the African continent, to tear down and foment civil war in Syria, which has cost us at least half a million lives, if not more than that. Um, and that, you know, if Obama were to get up and talk about radical Islamic terrorism, that would offend uh, these various Wahhabi and Muslim Brotherhood aligned groups that were being utilized as, as, as proxies to, to fight our battles for us and tear down nationalist and socialist and anti-imperialist governments that we don't particularly care for. Um, and I think that, that Brzezinski, uh, Brzezinski's ghost and Brzezinski's legacy is very, very well alive. And the Democrats are very much out of that, out of that tradition of foreign policy strategy. True. You know, it's funny, too, that these foreign policies, which which ought to be controversial and ought to be uh, the, the cause of great debate on Capitol Hill, are not. And they just continue regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of what party is in control of either the White House or the Congress. And they go for generations. It's the same thing year after year after year. And then we find ourselves in these endless wars. Yeah. You know, what, what's interesting is I, I become keenly aware of how, and by the way, uh, Brzezinski is listed in the little Ukraine's little black book that I have, by the way. I'll just say he's one of the names in there. Uh, what I noticed 
and I, I became keenly aware of it recently, is how Bannon himself specifically was involved in ginning up these uh, point counterpoint narratives kind of brilliantly, where he was working with white nationalists, period. But he's also really uh, has fealty to Zionists, too. And that seems like a contradiction at first. But that's what that's what Bannon was doing. So that Brzezinski thing you're talking about, Caleb, I mean, it's, it sounds like in a, it, in a way people don't appreciate what a skilled opera. I really mean this. People don't appreciate what a skilled operator Bannon is because he was able to work stuff behind the scenes. He's, his main audience is on the right, but he's ginning up these divisions, which is a tried and true technique. Go ahead, go ahead, Caleb. Well, well, I just wanted to add one difference that I think is very key between the Democrats and the Republicans or the, the left and the so-called right or the so-called left. Or, you know, the, one of the differences is kind of how they want the United States to per be perceived, not so much about what the United States does around the world, but rather how the United States is perceived, what kind of friendly gestures are made or not made, et cetera. Um, one key difference is that, you know, John Brennan, who was Obama's CIA director, made a really big point of saying that the CIA would never torture. Uh, they did not believe in torture. If Obama ever asked him to torture, he would resign. Well, you know, when Trump came in, John Brennan was out. Um, and first we had Mike Pompeo, and then he moved on to be secretary of state. And then Gina Haspel, uh, who has a reputation for being a defender of torture and harsh interrogation techniques, uh, she stepped up to lead the CIA. And then, you know, of course, she has stepped down and Biden will be replacing her. And it wasn't so much an attitude, a question of should the USA torture or not. I think the issue at hand is should the United States be perceived as a country that tortures? And on the right, uh, there's a feeling that we should be known as a strong country. You mess with us, we might torture you. We don't care if you like us. We don't care if you're friendly, but you mess with us. Be afraid. Peace through strength. On the left, there's this attitude that we should be perceived as this woke, human rights-loving country that is, is, you know, getting over it, racial injustice and intolerance. And it's really a matter of emphasis. What narrative should United, the United States put out there? An image of peace through strength, be terrified of us, work with us, or be afraid? Or, you know, uh, look, we're this amazing, human rights-loving, free society, and we want to bring some of that freedom to you. And wouldn't it be fun to work with us? We're really, really friendly. Uh, good cop, bad cop, almost. Well, okay, we got to go to a quick break here. When we, John, when we come back, I, I, you bring yeah. it back. And I'm very curious about what you have to say about what Caleb said. And I will see Caleb's interesting point and raise it, you know, half a chip, because Caleb's pretty damn smart, so I can't really outbet him. But I'm very curious, John. You being inside the CIA, did you see that dynamic in rank and file CIA, just the people, the guy at the next desk or the gal uh, at the yes. next desk? Did right. you see that? Did you see people who were on the right, on the, I mean, legitimately not playing a role, but you talked to them because uh, I heard back in the early days of the CIA, I've read, I read more books about that. There was the sort of Ivy League educated group and then there's the people who are kind of ex-cops ex-cia people and that was one cultural split within the cia we'll find out about that and more Caleb Malpin is our guest and of course i'm joined by my co-host the esteemed john kiriaku i'm lee stranahan this is the backstory Back to the backstory. I'm John Kiriakou. I'm here with my co-host Lee Stranahan. We were talking Lee a, a moment ago about uh, with Caleb about um, uh, the attitude at the CIA, the attitude at the rank and, uh, among the rank and file um, to to torture. And you know, it's it's kind of funny when I was there in uh, 2002 at the very start of the torture program. There were so few people who were read into the compartment. That when I was first read into it, there were only 16 people in the entire U.S. government who even knew that there was a torture program. Now, of course, that 
that changed little by little uh, in the intervening months. I'm talking about uh, the summer of 2002. And I can tell you that there was a big difference between the rank and file and the CIA's leadership. Uh, the rank and file thought this was a terrible idea. That first of all, it stained us. It dragged us down to the level of the people we were trying to fight. But at the leadership level, there was this there was this desire for revenge because they had dropped the ball. 9-11 happened on their watch. This was the worst intelligence failure in the history of the United States. 3,000 Americans died that day because they didn't do their jobs. And so whether torture worked or not was not an issue. It was not something that was discussed at that high level. It was torture for the sake of torture. And if we were able to gather information that might disrupt a future attack, then that was fine too. But in my view, it was just for revenge. It was at the lower level, at my level, where people said, this is wrong, 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 and we should not be in the business of doing it. See, everybody's shocked into silence. We were all shocked into silence. Also, there's three of us, and we can't see each other, and it's hard no one to talk. But uh, Caleb, do you have any thought, comments on what John said there? Well, no, I mean, it sounds quite morally reprehensible, um, you know, when it really gets down to it. And that, you know, I mean, I've heard many experts say that torture doesn't really work in terms of getting information. The reason that governments engage in torture is to terrify the population and have the population know or, or the enemy know that this is something that they are capable of doing. And that perhaps the rationale uh, might be that if folks are not afraid to die uh, because they are, they believe they will, they will go to heaven because they are martyrs for the faith, uh, that they will be terrified of getting tortured. But it really, at the end of the day, it is a, it is a, it is a tool of terrifying people. It is a tool of, of you know, getting people to submit and surrender. Uh, it's not a tool of gathering useful intelligence intelligence, from my understanding. Would you say that's correct? That's right. And you know, another thing too, that I think is very important, reasonable people can agree to disagree. First of all, though, it's a, it's a scientific fact that torture does not work. You just can't gather uh, actionable intelligence because the person being tortured will tell you anything that they think you want to know just to get you to stop. It might be true. It's likely not true, but either way, the torturer then has to pass all that information to a team of analysts to vet it. And by the time they finish vetting it, that bomb has gone off in XYZ city and you failed again. Uh, now, if, if you want to torture for the sake of torture, there are people on the right who think that this is a viable uh, option, that this is something that's not morally reprehensible and should be done. But if that's your position, you've got to change the law. Because the law is very clear. Torture is illegal. You can't just pretend that the law doesn't exist. You know, and, and forgive me for getting on my soapbox, but we have a law in this country called the uh, Torture Act of 1946. And it outlawed, specifically outlawed, exactly those techniques that our enemies, uh, that we used on our enemies after 9-11 like waterboarding, for example. I'm going to use waterboarding as the, as the example because it's the easiest one. Well, in 1946, we executed Japanese soldiers who had waterboarded American POWs. We executed them. In January of 1968, the Washington Post ran a front page photograph of an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. When that photo ran, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, ordered an investigation that very same day that soldier was arrested. He was charged with torture, convicted, and sentenced to 20 years in a military prison. Well, the law never changed from 1946 to 1968 to 2002 to 2021. The law never changed. We changed. But again, if we change, we can't just pretend that the law doesn't exist. Indeed. Now, the church... The Church Committee, though, did reveal that there were a lot of – I mean, this is not the first time the CIA has engaged in this kind of activity. I mean, this, this stuff went on during the 1960s and 70s, if I'm not mistaken, right? You're absolutely right, all the way up until 1974. Yeah, no, you know, one of the things that's – I'm just going to address something that's going on in the chat room, John, because there's somebody in there who – and I just, I just blocked him because I'm not 
a, a free speech purist on this point. I'm in favor of stupid. Uh, I'm opposed to stupid people. But somebody's in there saying, because they know a lot more than you, John, that uh -huh. A, you're lying, that, uh, that that. And then they're quoting this article where you said when you were uh, brought on that our boss said uh, to steer clear of 9-11 truthers, which I, I don't know if that's true, but I hope it is. And, and the reason why is there's enough bad stuff about 9-11 that's absolutely provable, such as the Saudi involvement in it and the, the pages that were missing, that I always think that bad information and a lot of the, and we, I've had Whitney Webb on the show. We talked about the dancing Israeli story and stuff like that. So we've had stuff that I hear 9-11 people, uh, truthers, like Van Jones, by the way, talk about. Uh, sometimes on the show, but I would like John you to respond. And Caleb, I'm curious about how you deal. Here's the thing: I don't think anyone could accuse me or John or Caleb of being establishment shills. So the idea <laughs> on here that that we're just going along with the establishment line on 9/11, I think it's complex. But I think that there's a lot of stupid stuff that gets said too. And I'm curious about how you deal with that as a journalist, Caleb. But, John, do you want to respond first? Go ahead. Yeah, listen, I, I take it on the chin from 9-11 truthers all the time. I take it on the chin from the from the pro-torture crowd. And uh, listen, I'm sorry, but I don't remember those guys being there when we were kicking down doors and taking names. So if anybody wants to challenge me, go ahead and challenge me. That doesn't mean I have to take you seriously seriously. That doesn't mean I have to take your silly opinion seriously. Especially if you're yapping from a chat room. 202-521-1320 is the number. And I say this all the time, and I mean it. Call in. If you want to say something, don't swear. You know, could, you know. Yeah, it's a live show. Don't swear. Act the way your mom would want you to act on the phone. But aside from that, Caleb, what's your, do you, I'm curious about, A, your take in general on what this 9-11 truther stuff that comes up. And, and go ahead, Caleb. Honestly, I have questions about the official story of 9-11, but that's all I have because I don't, as a journalist, say anything I do not know. And I don't know anything other than, you know, what about the 28 pages? What about Saudi involvement? Yes. You know, I, 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 there are other things that I just wonder about. But beyond that, you can't really do anything. And I'm, I'm very careful because there is so much out there about 9-11 that is very easy to debunk. There are so many things on the Internet that, that people allege that are mysterious about 9-11. And if you look at them, they're not based on reality. You have to be very careful because if you then repeat any of those things, you're immediately discredited. Um, and, uh, I, you know, there, there was a document that was revealed by Cass Sunstein, uh, who is the husband of Samantha Power. Um, and it talked about, you know, quote unquote, conspiracy theories being a threat to national security. And one of the proposed methods of dealing with these conspiracy theories that were considered to be a threat to national security was what they called cognitive infiltration. And that would be filling the Internet up with other conspiracy theories to discredit conspiracy theories. And um, <laughs> I've noticed that, you know, it, it seems weird after anything happens in the United States, anything immediately all over the Internet, it's declared a false flag. You would think that crimes don't happen, news events don't happen in the United States anymore, because immediately all over the Internet, no matter what happens, immediately uh, people are claiming it's a hoax. And that makes me wonder, you know, if somebody wanted to really actually have a hoax, it would no one would notice, because no matter what happens, it gets to be declared a hoax. And I think, on the one hand, that shows that there's a huge amount of public distrust of government, that people are ready to think anything's a hoax, number one. But I think it also shows that there's a, there's a bit of a conscious effort to create a light switch effect, where uh, basically you believe everything mainstream media says, or everything's a false flag and a hoax done by the reptile people and the Illuminati, and you're one of the crazies. And, and that kind of is the dynamic that they've created. Either believe everything mainstream U.S. media says 100 percent or be a loony. And obviously the truth is somewhere in the middle. U.S. mainstream media has gotten it wrong on a number of occasions. Uh, there have been lies in American media like weapons of mass destruction and such, but there is also a lot of a lot of, you know, you know, very, very confused and delusional people out there, you know, putting out their views on the Internet. So, you know, it, it, by creating that light switch effect, we can't really have a, a conversation. And if you just introduce the conspiracy allegation into the conversation, it poisons everything in a way. No, I, I agree. And it's, it's, it's the same as racism. You know, I was talking to uh, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro about this. 
uh, recently. You know, as I, and I've talked, I've, I've talked about it a lot. That the fact is, if you talk about Soros, you're anti-Semitic, is a way right. to avoid conversation about Soros. And on the other hand, there is such a thing as anti-Semitism. And so, if 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 I'm talking about uh, the Rothschilds' connection to Genie Energy, and someone jumps in and goes, "Yeah, and they're Jews," I go, "I don't know why I did the Southern accent there, but you know, it's stereotypical." But uh, but because you could be Yankee, you could have any accent and hate Jews. That's fine. But you don't need a Southern accent is my point. But I immediately you've derailed the conversation. You just took it. What? What are you doing? And now let's see how this goes. Actually, I know Dave a little bit, so I, I'm glad he called in. I said to people, call in 202-521-1320 to comment on this topic. Dave from California, what is your take, sir? Hello, people. Uh, you you all you all have a fantastic point about the the nuttiness because I've heard the the planes didn't exist and I've heard that there was beams being fired from satellites and all kinds of crap. But hey, <laughs> how about how about the pile drivers that damaged the destroyed the entire buildings not once but twice through the path of most resistance and then when the dust cleared they were gone. What happened to the pile drivers, the upper floors that destroyed the buildings because they they weren't even in the picture when the buildings were completely demolished, they were gone. So what happened there? That, that's my question, and that's I'd like to hear you guys take on that, and I'll take it off the air. Thanks a lot, Lee. Thank, thanks, Dave. Uh, John, you want to take that one? Caleb, you got anything? Honest to God, that's the first time I've heard that. I, I haven't heard I haven't heard it before. My apologies, Caleb. Do you know anything? Same. Yeah. I've ne- yeah I've never heard it either. Sorry, Dave. Sorry, Dave. I've never heard it either. And also, that's it's almost like an engineering question in a way, which I will admit that I'm completely unqualified. I'm not an engineer. And, you know, that's it. But I, I've actually never heard that one before. OK, well, can I can I make one other comment too, real quickly? C- Caleb, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dave. Dave made an important point, too. I, I've heard I've heard the same stories that it was it was the quote unquote Jews. It was the the Saudis. It was the space aliens. It was, you know, an inside job. It was the Bush family. It was the Cheney family. I've heard all these these crazy stories uh, over the years. With that said, there are a lot of legitimate questions that have never been answered. You know, we could ha- we could do a whole show on the 28 pages. We could do a whole show on the Saudi royal family. I'll tell you just one quick anecdote if we have the time. I think we have seven or eight minutes left. When we captured Abu Zubaydah in Pakistan on the night of March 22nd, 2002, I confiscated his diary and I he had been shot and severely wounded and my orders were to remain at his bedside. So I started leafing through the diary and it wasn't just a diary. It was a doodle book, a sketchbook, an address book. He would jot down notes to himself. Well, there were names and cell phone numbers of three members of the Saudi Royal family in that, in that book. And I wrote them down and I sent them to headquarters in a cable Well, headquarters then contacted the Saudi government and said, hey, we want to talk to these three princes because their their personal information, their private cell phone numbers were in Abu Zubaydah's diary. Well, before we could speak to them, before we could interview them or interrogate them, uh, one died in a fiery car crash uh, on a highway in central Saudi Arabia all by himself, single car crash. Uh, one went camping in the desert and nobody ever saw him again. And the third one went camping in the desert and died of thirst. So, you know, it makes me wonder, it makes a lot of people wonder what exactly was the role of the Saudi Royal family or was it rogue elements of the Saudi Royal family? This is a question that has never been answered and nobody ever wanted to pursue it. And it also makes a lot of people wonder why anyone would ever go camping in Saudi Arabia. But indeed, <laughs> let's quickly get to uh, Greg from Kansas City, who was the person in the chat room. Thanks for calling in, Greg, and uh, and not just yapping from the chat room. Go ahead. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, by the way, the article I mentioned it's from uh, the New, New Republic uh, 
profile on uh, Chiriaki and Sputnik. So anyway, by the way, though, um, what really got me was the uh, was the line about you know calling some chat room. I don't know if you remember. I've been trying for probably close to a year to reach out and have a dialogue with you. I even talked with your son uh, Shane briefly. Uh, tried to coordinate, and to his to his credit, he was very respectful. I mean, I've I've been for months trying to talk with you about a number of things, ranging all the way from the actual roots and the actual um, uh, what Breitbart actually represents to like the real Steve Bannon to a number of things, and you know, you and you, you ultimately ended up blocking me on uh, on Twitter. But I mean, we I've been trying to have this dialogue with you for a while, Lee. And I, well, if I if I, I I almost never block people, so if I block the people, and by the way. I've been a I, I had the same 2020 as everybody else. And I've been going through an absolutely brutal divorce and other stuff. And so sorry, I sorry. But if, if I had to block you on Twitter, I almost never block people, Greg. Well, I think it was over me critiquing your interview with uh, David Horowitz, with uh, Lee, by the way. And then I also we critiqued. Uh, also, I was very critical of your uh, of your apologetics for for Roger Stone as well. But uh, look, I don't want to get into your private life. That's no, I'm not in any way, shape, or form trying to do that. But I mean, I still still think like I really tried hard to actually coordinate a real dialogue. Greg, Greg, here's here's the problem I got right now. I've got a few minutes left in the show, and we got two more callers. So do me a favor. Call back again sometime on an open segment. I'm not trying to blow you off now, but I have to blow you off now. So call back again on another segment, and we will handle that. 202-521-1320. Mattia from Australia, go ahead. Hi, hi, hi. Um, I would like to ask you about uh, the Ukrainian black book, how you're talking about it. Yes. Um, I I done my information about uh, medical mm-hmm. Alexander Chalupa in, 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 and the Chalupa sisters. And they have another 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 family member with the Chalupas. Okay, so I, I will tell you a family member, and, and then I got to go to the next call. Neither Alexander or Andrea Chalupa are mentioned in here, but their father, Leo Chalupa, is mentioned. And Leo Chalupa is somebody who I haven't even talked about much, but he is right in this uh, small number of contacts that the Ukrainian embassy. He's a he's a I, I believe a teacher or a researcher, and I believe at George Washington University, but it could be Georgetown because it confuses me because they both have the name George in them and they're both in DC, so I get confused sometimes. 202-521-1320, real quickly, Tarif, we only got it, we only got a few seconds here. What's on your mind? Okay, uh, free Julian Assange, we love you, man. We're still fighting for you. Uh, I was listening to George Gallery earlier today. They were talking about Biden administration, um, new deal with, um, uh, Iran is not the same deal with uh, Barack Obama had. It's something totally different. And then he was saying that a Biden administration might want the, um, for the um, Iranians to dis- disarm from the missiles, to basically destroy the um, long-range missiles, which, you know, the Iranians ain't going to do. So that's going to be uh, make things worse, you know. So, uh, you know, hopefully we get peace in the world, you know. So Yeah, Tariq, thanks for the call. Let me just make sure. See, John, I was having to do basically air traffic control there because we had so many calls. Yeah, that was that was tough. We had so many callers. Yeah. I guess if you mention 9-11, the phone lines light up. I don't know, something like that. Let's let's go to the last point. How do you see, do you think, John and Caleb, do you think that Biden is putting a poison pill in this new Iran reset he's sort of talking about? Caleb, let's go to you first. I think uh, that Trump buried the Iran deal uh, when he ripped it up, uh, when he assassinated Qasem Soleimani. Uh, at this point, I, I really doubt the supreme leader of Iran is going to allow new negotiations to take place. Uh, I think Iran made huge concessions in Geneva. And, and at this point, uh, any any chance of, of the supreme leader of Iran saying, OK, well, we're going to go ahead and negotiate once again with the United States. I just don't think it's going to happen. OK, John. Because we only got a few seconds left. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, I think that we might have crossed the point of no return. And uh, I, I'm not optimistic. Even if Biden's um, head and heart are in the right place, I, I don't expect anything great to happen. OK. And it looks like I get the final word because we're about out of time. Caleb, it's always great to have you on the show. The final word is don't go camping in Saudi Arabia. That's my advice. Because <laughs> I know people who have my, my kids go camping, my older kids. And I've never been like, maybe they'll die of thirst or something. I don't even know. But that's a bad string of luck there. Yeah, who dies of thirst? How does that happen? Very tricky. It is Saudi Arabia. I'm Lee Stranahan, joined by my co-host, John Kiriakou. We'll be back tomorrow. This is The Backstory. Backstory.